All right, good afternoon, everyone. Good to see all of you for this uh, CMO call focused on church school partnerships in uh, the midst of this pandemic. Um, welcome. I want to uh, offer us a kind of centering thought and, and then just a quick word about uh, the purpose of the call before we jump into it. So <clears throat> I just wanted to share uh, a few verses of scripture. This is from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians. It strikes me as uh, especially relevant uh, to all of us, I'd imagine, uh, in these days, because these are, are words that Paul offers uh, to help us, all of us, deal with whatever kind of anxiety or stress um, that we may be feeling in the midst of all of the um, ways that our lives continue to be unsettled and, uh, and fairly open-ended and uncertain looking ahead. And so these are uh, from Philippians chapter 4, verse uh, 4 and following. To hear these words, um, pray their blessing to you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness show in your treatment of all people. The Lord is near. Don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. From now on, brothers and sisters, if anything is excellent and if anything is admirable, focus your thoughts on these things. All that is true, all that is holy, all that is just, all that is pure, all that is lovely, and all that is worthy of praise. Practice these things. And whatever you learned, received, heard, or saw in us, the God of peace will be with you. Let us pray. Holy God, in the midst of these anxious and uncertain times, we do pray that, that your peace would be like a sentinel standing guard over our hearts and help us to uh, experience a kind of, of certainty that we can only find in you. God, we pray that you would help our minds to dwell um, not endlessly on our worries and on things we cannot predict and do not know, but rather to focus on the things that are worthy and the things that are excellent in your sight. For God, we know that uh, the way that we focus our thoughts in each moment have a way of shaping the condition of our souls. God, work in us and may your spirit uh, continue to shape us for leadership in these days. Grant us your peace. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, again, welcome to this call that's focused on uh, ministry with our neighbors, specifically uh, through our partnerships with our neighborhood schools. Uh, in just a moment, Andrew is going to introduce um, folks we've invited to be on this panel uh, for them to lend their experience and wisdom to us. Um, I just want to share that uh, I have three uh, school age kids um, who have been at home with me during this pandemic, one college age, one high school age, one middle school age. That's given me a, an upfront, uh, you know, front row seat to the ways that our schools and institutions have been um, adapting and the ways that uh, administrators and teachers and school staffs have all been um, adjusting to try to do their important work under these new conditions. And it, it creates all kinds of opportunities, I think, for us to come alongside them in a spirit of support and encouragement and even to, um, to amplify their work. Um, we know that uh, our schools in a unique way are on the front lines, um, helping to feed students and families the way that they do all throughout the school year. And that again, creates uh, opportunities for us in the faith community to come alongside them. And just today, uh, 
you know, my school, my kids are now finishing their school year. Um, each of them, they may have like a couple of class sessions left. My college age student is all done. Um, and I found myself thinking this morning about the fall and about the kinds of preparations and possibilities that our, again, our administrators and teachers are, are considering and preparing for and wondering um, what kinds of footholds that might create for us, again, in the faith community to uh, be a neighbor to them in an important way. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the opportunities that have been and that are around the corner are many. And I know we'll get to hear about some of those from our panelists and hopefully um, dream together a bit about how we can step into our communities in, in this particular niche in a really powerful and profound way. Um, you know, for years now, uh, we have known and we've experienced that by partnering with our neighborhood schools, we have a unique way uh, to be in ministry with children and parents and communities. Um, all around us. And so hopefully, again, this conversation will uh, strengthen um, our, our efforts in that regard. So again, I'm so glad that all of you are on this call. So uh, Andrew, why don't you take it from here? All right. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, rather, and um, welcome, everyone. I want to especially welcome uh, those who are serving on our panel conversation today. We have Reverend Holly Bandell, who serves uh, with First Church Dallas as the Associate Minister for Mission and Advocacy, uh, Reverend Montreal Martin, who's the lead pastor at Wheatland UMC and also serves as a, a chaplain with uh, Methodist Healthcare System, um, and then Reverend Dana Coker, who's the senior pastor serving with First United Methodist Church in Bonham, Texas. So, as a way of introducing ourselves um, and to jump right in, uh, it'd be, I think, helpful to set the context for the kind of work that your church did and that you did with schools before the COVID-19 pandemic. How were you engaged with the schools before then? And anyone, uh, feel free to, to step forward first. This is uh, Patty in Denton, and we oh. uh, provided what we called our back. Patty, we're just going to hold off real quick on oh. the, um, we're going to just hold that thought and uh, start with the panel first, and then I'd love for you to jump jump in here in just a bit. So, uh, Holly, would you begin? Sure. Um, so, we've had a partnership with J.J. Rhodes Learning Center and um, South Dallas Fair Park for um, six years, and um, and so we've been serving down there in a multitude of different ways, um, tutors, uh, teacher appreciation, attendance incentives, um, some of our great uh, church leaders like Tom Martin and Bud Brown that are on the call have been helping us serve in leadership with Dallas ISD um, on, you know, SBDM committee for the, for the school and really helping us to um, connect with the school in deeper and deeper ways. And so we're, um, so I would say that over the six year partnership, we've had um, four, uh, five, four or five different principles. And so that has been a part of our story has been able to be willing to transition. Um, and so that that's kind of how we are kind of hands on serving with schools. We also um, house one plus one Dallas, which is a bridge building group um, really launched from North Texas Conference with a one plus one effort to um, help other faith communities connect with Dallas ISD schools. And so we've been doing that for several years. And finally, we've kind of um, also put ourselves forward to learn about public education and advocacy in the state and with Pastors for Texas Children have really found good resource to help us talk to our legislators about public education and the funding that's needed. Um, particularly in Dallas, but all over the state for different needs. Thanks, Holly. Um, and could you just, by way of introduction, share a little bit, a little bit about what Pastors for Texas Children is? Yeah. So they are an advocacy uh, um, a group that um, works with uh, congregations, faith communities all over the state 
to um, really empower congregations, not only to be in their neighborhood schools, but also to take the next step and do what's needed at the state level to, to really do some legislative advocacy. And if you know anything about Texas history um, of education, it's been poorly funded for many years. Um, and the formula we're using is kind of broken at this point. And so Pastors for Texas Children really helps to connect faith communities with a larger need of public education um, today and now across the U.S. Great, thanks. And uh, if you could find the link to maybe their website, mm -hmm. uh, it would be really great to provide that for people who might be interested. Uh, Dana, tell us a little bit about your context and the way that uh, First UMC Bonham has been engaged in their church sure. relationship. Um, um, obviously, Bonham is uh, a lot more rural than Dallas, and so um, I would say uh, our program is is has really taken off based on uh, relationships that that have been formed. So we started um, four years ago just by um, creating prayer buddies in our congregation. So everyone on the staff of our partner school, we started praying for, and we sort of um, uh, re enlivened a dormant um, mentoring program and. From there, we were on campus and so started hearing about needs and were able to respond. So uh, we learned that the teachers um, didn't have enough books in their classroom library. So we had a huge book drive and um, we started doing teacher appreciation meals and um, pizza cookies and all kinds of stuff. But um, in one of the meals, we learned that there was a playground that um, there was no shade in and the teachers were hot. So we uh, put a pergola in there for them. Um, which helped in a lot of ways. And um, uh, I got to be trusted enough on the campus that they asked me to, to do the devotional for the staff before star testing and things like that. And then uh, we eventually developed a relationship um, with the superintendent um, so that, um, that once a month, any pastor who wants to has breakfast with um, administrators from all the campuses. And so from there, uh, we really, got expanded reach onto the onto the campuses um so that like when there was an ice raid and kids were scared to go to school um we were we were able to partner with the school district to find out uh how to get food to those families and um a, you know family has a fire they call uh so that we can assist uh, people like that um, um we've expanded the backpack programs to all the campuses now and uh, we've started some closed closets on uh, several of the campuses and uh, collect hygiene products and um, stuff like that. So um, I don't know. It, uh, I, I, uh, I know I'm friends with the administrators now, so uh, there's just constant conversation and it's kind of organic, but um, it's driven by their needs and, and what they see. Thanks, Dana. And uh, in Montreal, could you share a little bit about uh, y'all's relationship with local schools? In your Absolutely. Area? Yeah, so good, every, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so <clears throat> Wheatland uh, sits in uh, the Redbird community of Dallas, and um, there's two uh, particular schools that Wheatland had a relationship prior to my coming there. Um, and so I kind of reestablish those relationships because it kind of went to the wayside uh, as the membership got, got had gotten older. Um, they weren't necessarily as engaged with the schools uh, uh, as previously. And so um, upon me getting there, uh, as I do when I go to any, any community, I kind of did my asset mapping and everything and just seeing what the needs were. But um, as I was doing that, I noticed um, I noticed two child, two uh, two two boys, high school age boys, uh, just roaming around Wheatland's campus. Uh, for those who haven't been <clears throat> necessarily um, at Wheatland or have been on this campus, uh, it sits on 11 plus acres, uh, and uh, with the old with a school building and uh, just open space, green space. And so uh, these two boys, they were uh, just uh, just walking around campus and got a chance to just uh, talk, you know, just talk to them and uh, notice that they were kind of 
that they were number one, they were skipping school, but number two, that they had uh, soil clothing and um, uh, their hygiene wasn't up necessarily up to par. Uh, so just conversing with them, uh, I found out that they were homeless and that they were sleeping in, in one of the school buildings on the campus of Wheaton. And so, um, Made, so I made connections with them uh, in regards to um, just seeing how their needs can be made and then found out that they went to Carter High School. And so um, made connection with Carter High School uh, uh, and just rebade, as I said, reestablished that, that uh, relationship uh, with Carter High School and found out what the needs that they had there on their campus. And then also Bertie Alexander uh, Elementary School. And so both of these schools are in um, impoverished communities and, and uh, both schools at the time, um, about a year and a half, of, uh, almost two years ago, they were, um, they were at a grade level that the school district that DISD gives them, uh, Bertie Alexander were at a level D. They, their grade was a D. And I think um, Carter was a C at that time. Um, and so just uh, so I met with all the administrators and uh, to see how can Wheeland in partnership um, assist in whatever needs that we possibly can. And so just um, just being cognizant and noticing some of the needs, such as some of the students um, wearing soil clothing, you know, when I visit these schools and just noticing these needs. Um, I um, started a laundry, well, Wheatland started a laundry center um, program, um, which, short, which was short lived due to the fires on our campus. But um, that was one program that we were able to just assist in. And then also with mentoring uh, the young men who don't have um, uh, fathers in their lives or adult men to be that surrogate father or uh, be a, uh, somewhat of a role model in their lives. Um, and that's just simply um, just sitting down myself, sitting down in the classroom at Birdie or at Carter with that young man, because I, I can relate to him, uh, not only because I'm black, but also I can relate to him because, you know, I didn't have a father in my life. And so just making that that relationship. And so mentoring was a, is another big piece. Um, also um, uh, haircuts. We noticed that the, the, some of the students didn't have access to, <laughs> to not only um, showers and, uh, laundry, but they also couldn't afford a, a haircut. And so uh, I partnered with the barbershop to come and set up shop on campus. So Wheeling has a barbershop on campus and um, uh, the students can come and receive a free haircut uh, every two weeks um, at no charge. And, um, and so that's just some of the things that we're, that we're doing uh, in partnership with uh, those schools. That's great. So I wonder, um, you know, Holly, Dana, Montreal, jump in as you as you feel led. Um, what did you first start to notice and hear from your school partners about the needs that were emerging once COVID nineteen really set in around here? I mean, the first big thing um, was just to scramble to make sure everybody was being fed. Um, we, we're a pretty, um, we have a pretty high degree of poverty in our area. So, uh, all of our kids receive a free breakfast, um, cause it's easier than trying to separate the few that could afford it. So, um, so that was the first scramble and, and to figure out how to get the backpacks to continue to go out. Um, uh, but I, I think everyone thought it was just going to be a few weeks and so, I think kind of, I think the school district thought if we can just hold on for three weeks, we'll be fine, food, you know, it'll be all right. But the, the longer that this has gone on, um, you know, uh, there's a whole lot of kids that don't have internet and don't have uh, 
devices to do online learning in a in the same way that kids with means have and so that's a that's a long-term issue of of how to uh, creatively get them access to their teachers in the same way that the kids that can afford it can um, and i don't think we've solved that problem in this school semester um, they sort of have three different plans going forward for the summer and the the fall and nobody knows which plan they're going to get to enact and so um, I can see long term that being an issue that we've got to address. It can't keep going that same way or we're just going to have a huge divide in learning. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the mental health is the other big thing. Um, like halfway through this, um, I started asking teachers, how are you? I know you're checking on all of us, but how are you? And, you know, 45, 50 minutes later, I was realizing that um, they weren't really okay. And so, um, we're trying to figure out ways to um, provide outlets for teachers that are isolated and stressed out and um, grieving the, the weird loss to their school year. Wow, thanks Dana. Yeah, Holly? And, yeah same, for, same for us. I mean, it was all about food, I think for the first three weeks or so, just make, getting, making sure that everybody could get fed. It was a real scramble for um, our, our um, lunch employees and staff to figure out how to make all that work. I mean, in Dallas, everybody get, you know, all the children get a, get option for free breakfast and lunch. And so that's, at some point they said a half a million meals a week um, for Dallas ISD students and their families. And so, hmm that just became at the forefront of how do you logistically operate that. So we did, we sent volunteers out to do that in different schools. And as time went on, the sensing things kind of got better. Um, and so, um, um, you know, just wanted to be supportive of what needed to happen. And basically for our, our administrator at our school and for our teachers, it kind of was radio silence because everything changed overnight. No longer were we meeting in person, we were meeting virtually. Um, for those that had access, I think, Dana, access is a huge issue. Um, Dallas is, is, is beginning to address that really head on. At one point, they said 90% of students were online and, and working. Um, well, the 10% are the ones that don't have access, right? And, and, it's, and, it, um, and so, I mean, two points of that. One is the actual physical capability right, of having Wi-Fi in the home or a hotspot or something. And the second is someone to pay for it. And so I think those are two huge issues going forward. I know that Dallas ISD is addressing head on. So eventually we reached out to our, our administrator and our um, people we knew at the school and had good personal relationships. And then they really just, and, and it took them a couple of weeks to kind of like get their head above water and say, okay, like, like my teachers aren't well is what we heard. And so, um, Dr. Stoker at our church went and got on a staff call and did some techniques and did a little bit of spiritual and mental wellness kinds of um, things on that staff meeting. Um, I went by last week and dropped off stress balls because I knew they were going to be coming in. <laughs> and, so I, and, and you should have seen the principal's face. We actually, it was a really amazing God moment. I drove up at 8 a.m. She's driving in at 8 a.m. Neither of us know the other one is coming, right? So it, it was really one of those moments to add a presence, a socially distanced presence and um, some care. And I do think that, um, and we'll get to the going forward stuff, but I do think this is where we as faith communities can have a real honest spiritual wellness presence with our schools by just doing things that are even unexpected. I mean, what, what these teachers would love for a cookie when they when they are going up to pack up their rooms or you know a box lunch or or just um to know that someone cares i i think is a is a real concern so it did take us some weeks to kind of be in touch with our partners but i think for the most part our um school partners right now are 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 just are are needing some support and encouragement and spiritual presence hmm. right 
And Montreal, what you know, what were the things that you you know first noticed and and heard from um, from the schools that you work with? Uh, initially, it was probably uh, for both schools. It was uh, transportation. Um, mm -hmm. Most parents there uh, they rely on either public transportation uh, or um, the or DISD uh, transportation, and so. Um, with the lack thereof and the, the, the rules and the policies that were in place of, you know, having to have a, uh, a car to, to, you know, pick the food up and, and everything, uh, some parents were just not able to do that. So that was one initial problem that we, that we had to address. And then another one was probably um, the uh, lack of food for a household. And so, uh, as, as some of you may know, um, you know, the, the families here in this, uh, at these schools, so they may have a, a child that goes to that school who that meal is provided to. However, um, there's still uh, five to six other, whether they're children or adults, that's living in that household mm -hmm. that's uh, undocumented or don't they don't know about so therefore they're unaccounted for and so uh, so we had that 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 initial problem as well uh, and so um, just the overwhelm of amount of feelings of you know will there be enough food for me my kids I just lost my job and so but all this just happening at once that caused a huge a lot of anxiety. Uh, not only for the parents, but also for the teachers and the staff um, of these schools, and so uh, and the volunteers as well. And so, a lot of a lot of volunteers they they came together, and uh, from what I know, uh, to help in whatever way they can to address those needs. So, thanks. So, what I'm wondering is, you know, how have um, you know since that first week or two. How have uh, the needs uh, changed with the schools and students and families and staff and teachers? Um, and like, what what's the situation on the ground now, like this week? I, I think the stress sort of um, snowballs. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, parents are either working and trying to teach at home or they don't have a job and are trying to teach at home and both scenarios are ridiculously stressful and and so the longer this has gone on it has mounted that pressure and and i think um at the beginning a whole lot of families were finding ways uh, at the beginning to sort of make it through um but i just see an increasing desperation um at our emergency food distributions and um, I, I don't know. I just think, I think it, it takes an increasingly larger toll. Um, so mental health has become really my major mental health as it relates to it, that manifests itself in so many different ways, whether that's child abuse or, um, domestic violence or, uh, or just depression or, um, you know, I think it manifests itself in a whole lot of ways, but, um, we we have I like the stress spiral idea, Holly. We we uh, we started a um, a super we call it Tuesday Super Suppers, and it's a hot meal instead of the emergency uh, food box type of a thing. Um, and we did that because we think there's more joy in a home cooked hot meal, um, and you would be amazed at how fast we ran out of food. Um, so we're trying to do things that bring some joy um on top of just meeting the basic needs because um if they're surviving but joylessly we have a larger problem going forward i think hmm. thanks uh, montreal uh, holly how have things change where, where are things today yeah i think ditto to to dana the needs in dallas are just increasing and I think getting more desperate. And so, I mean, we were contacted this week about from the city about doing some kind of milk distribution. And so, I mean, I just think that there's just going to be greater and greater and greater need. Yeah, don't 
don't quote me on the milk. I don't know how it's going to work out, but but I, I just feel like across the city um, that it's 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 getting and and I think you know the family at home and how you deal with that longer term without you know many childcare options camps and things that are regularly done to really help parents work in the situation of summer. I think there are two kind of cycles in my mind going on. What's going to happen in summer? How are we going to feed all these kids over the summer? We're going to continue to do the same things we're doing. Are we going to do other things? Um, how, how do kids maintain a sense of schedule and, and kind of having some opportunity in the summer? Um, um, and, and that allows parents to either get a break or get a, go to work. I mean, however that might need to work. Um, and how do how are kids safe at home for this extended period of time? And so, um, so I think all of those things are running my mind. And then I think there's another cycle of uh, how are we going back to school? And I think there there are so many plans right now. It's really hard um, to judge what that's going to be like. We're being looped in with our school and Dallas ISD on some of those plans, just to kind of you know, figure out how can we plug in as partners in that. And I think the, so there's no way to speculate that. I just think the being in touch with the school is really important. One of the things that we've begun to embrace at our um, church is a thing called Care Portal. I'm gonna put it in the chat. And it is basically an online way of um, CPS workers, Dallas ISD counselors, community liaisons, administrators, putting in needs of families. And then as a faith community, once we're trained on it and entered in the system, we can spawn, respond directly to that caseworker to fulfill the needs of children, vulnerable children and their families. Um, it's, it's, you know, kind of uh, across the state in many different places. And um, Bud Brown, who's on the call, is um, one of our members that is related directly to to care portal. I'll put his information in the care portal link in there. But we've had a couple of times where we were responded. I got a call one day from um, that there was a one coming online of a nine year old girl who was in the hospital, who was a Dallas ISD student and needed clothing that would help her recover. And so we, you know, responded to that need. Um, and whether it's clothing or glasses or beds or, you know, whatever the need may be for that food. For that family to really have an opportunity as a faith community to rally around some of these families during during this time of crisis because we know the need is just to um, increase so I, I hope that's helpful yeah so kind of i echo what the what dana and holly just uh mentioned uh especially with the increase uh of need for food pantry, but no one is accepting um, new, app new applications uh, to their food banks. And so you have that anxiety. Uh, and then with school, with school getting ready to formally uh, end this, um, this school year, um, you have that, that component as well. And so uh, just hearing from uh, families and parents, uh, single mothers, single fathers, grandmothers uh, who are taking care of their grandchildren, school age grandchildren, just hearing from them, uh, it's already, it was already hard enough pre this pandemic. Now you add this component, you add this layer of hardship on, it's, it's all very overwhelming. Uh, according to one, one grandmother who told me just speaking with her, it was very, it's very overwhelming. And then especially with the, um, these, the stimulus, um, ordeal that the city put out, um, which, you know, most families didn't even qualify for. And so, um, just that level of, just that level of anxiety, that, that roller coaster, it's a roller coaster of emotions for, uh, most of these uh, families that that um, of these partnering schools, and so um, one way that that Wheatland uh, is responding um, uh, to this is um, we're partnering up with a um, a organization uh, to provide hot meals um, 
throughout the summer and probably um, for the next school year. But we're going to see uh, how this summer goes first, because what what I notice and just hearing just and I always always go off of what I hear from these families, just hearing from them. The food that the food that they receive is not adequate enough. I mean, it go it gives it gives breakfast, lunch, but we all know kids are active and everything, and so they need a they need a snack here. Then you got the older kids who's growing, they're maturing, and everything, and so they need they need more food. And so uh, by the time it gets to dinner time, um, you know, it's very limited, and so. Um, so we're partnering with the organization to provide them a hot meal um, uh, Monday through Friday, and so um, and so that's one way, as well as hygiene items and those those basic necessity uh, essential items that 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 sometimes we take granted for. So just providing those things, as well as uh, prayer. Um, I was at Hamilton Park volunteering, and um, just, just, just hearing them. One guy said, "You know, what else can we do for him?" Was the question that was asked, and he said, um, "I don't have a church home. I just need prayer. I don't know how how I'm going to get through this, uh, and so I just need some guidance." And so, um, you know, just just attending to their spiritual need um, as well, and and not to overburden them with that spiritual need, but just listening out. Make sure we listen out for that that component and need as well um, is what we're trying our best to do as well. Uh, and so, but that's what, that's how we're, that's what's happening on the ground now. Uh, families just worried with school letting out uh, this week, next week, um, you know, what are we going to do? Some schools, so I know Carter and Birdie, they will continue to provide breakfast only uh, after the school year ends, but they still have that lunch and they still need that dinner. And so, um, just working with those administrators uh, and teachers uh, who want to continue to keep this relationship, keep this momentum going, uh, because we don't know what uh, this this upcoming school year may bring. We just don't know. And so, if we can somehow just keep keep this relationship, keep this conversation uh, going, um, and that's what we're trying to do uh, as far as uh, our partnerships. And that, that was my next uh, question is, you know, as you look toward the summer and this next school year, what are you hearing and seeing? Um, so I hear you saying, you know, Montreal, you're really just trying to keep that relationship up, work with the meals, um, others. What, what are you hearing and, and seeing about the next school year? I know y'all, you, uh, Dana and Holly, have spoken a little bit to that. Um, how are y'all kind of keeping that relationship up through these unknowns? I, it's so hard to plan um, very far ahead because things seem to change so quickly right now. So I'm, you know, I'm communicating with the superintendent um, at least once a week and, and she's not sure what's going to happen even this summer. And so it's, um, so, so I don't know if, um, I don't, I just don't know, Andrew. I, I think it's a really fluid um, situation and, and I, I, I do have in the back of my mind, if, if we can't get FaceTime with these kids, uh, um, we absolutely have to figure out this technology gap um, because it, it is just crucial that, that these kids aren't falling behind, not only falling behind, but falling uh, behind at different rates. Um, right. It's just going to create a disparity that is will be increasingly hard to overcome the long longer this lasts. So, so I don't I don't know if we're going to have to go full throttle on that yet. Um, I know they don't want to. I, I know they want to get back to FaceTime, which um, uh, so so I, I really don't know other than uh, being in constant contact with the the principals and superintendent. Um, so that we're right there as soon as a decision's made, we can start working. Um, but I, I would imagine, uh, I would imagine food will become a, a bigger deal this summer because the school has been uh, financing so much of the, the distribution for the kiddos. Um, we're going to have to step up our game in our distributions. 
Okay. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I think the food is, is number one in trying to address all need over the summer. And we know that like in Dallas eviction um, moratoriums are being lifted at, in different mm. places and in different ways. And so we just know that for, for children that are already vulnerable in their families, that that is just gonna create um, you know, more hunger in our communities. And so that's a major concern in Dallas um, is to be watching how those more um, moratorium on evictions as they release who who need who can't pay for a home and so now not only you got hunger you got no no and so then all basic needs are, are are slipping away are slipping away fast I think in terms of the education realm um, virtual learning I think I think it's just going to be what we do it, at some level um, for for a long time and. So for us as partners, that means kind of um, our, our, we are we are kind of changing the way we're approaching that. How do we do tutoring um, online? How do we do mentoring online? Um, how do we set that up at, the, up at the beginning of the school year so that we're not having to change course mid school year? And so things like you know we get permission from parents to read to kids. Well, um, we need to get permission to do that virtually so that in, if we're ever back in this situation. We have that capability online and ready to go and, and our tutors trained and all of that kind of stuff. I think the other thing, um, uh, I think one of the things too to really watch, and this is kind of 30,000 feet, but um, in our state, what we're gonna see is a run on resources in all different areas because there's so many hungry jobless people. Um, not only that were before, and without health care, but now even more. And so um, what, what when that happens in our kind of disaster, public education funds is gonna take a hit and that's gonna make it even harder. And so I, I think to be connected to some organizations for your, for your partners be, that, that are kind of following this funding on the state level around public education so that we can really secure that. I already see um, some of our people in our state leveraging charter schools again. Um, and we can have a long question about that. Basically, the bottom line is charter schools as a whole very poorly. There are exceptions if you're a charter school. You, I don't need a nasty gram, but, <laughs> but as a whole, they just don't perform well at all. And so we are already seeing applications for charter schools all across our state to come and do virtual learning. And I just would say I'm very uncomfortable with that at this point. I mean, it seems like an opportunistic kind of thing in a time when people are really hurting and needing basic needs. And so I think to be connected to Pastors for Texas Children, Texas Impact, some of these organizations that can help us know what's going on with funding in the state and being aware of that. State legislator meets in January. Um, and so these, and so this is the time to get read up on what that advocacy would need to be looked like. So that's 30,000 feet. I know um, we've, we've talked about the on the ground stuff for, I hope, I hope that's helpful. That's really helpful to mention the, the 30,000 feet piece because, you know, so many of us, I think, are engaged day-to-day um, -day on the ground, and it's, it can be sometimes really difficult to see what this kind of advocacy piece is, especially when there's so many headlines um, making news and, and possibly drowning those things out. Um, and we know, you know, those of you who may be in smaller communities, uh, to have the, the state be able to be an advocate and have the backs of school systems in our communities uh, means that the stress that is put on faith communities, other nonprofits uh, is lessened if we can fully uh, fund and support our education systems through, um, through these times and in normal times, um, it should be said. So there's, uh, there's a lot going on in terms of the, the many um, forces that uh, are affecting the children that our churches care about, that many of you who are already engaged in your schools 
um, will have faces come to mind of children that you work with uh, day in and day out. Kids that go to your church, kids that you mentor and tutor. And it is overwhelming, I think, for some of us to think through uh, these factors of food, access to virtual learning, having um, a stable uh, parent and home environment um, and tutoring, they're able to you know, help that student focus and concentrate on a, a virtual learning environment, which is hard enough uh, for those that are um, very secure in their, in their life. Um, and so we want to really be able to be in prayer for them. Um, love to open it up at this time for what others are seeing in their environments. I know, Patty, you had, if you're still with us, um, had some things that you found helpful um, in your context. Uh, do you have questions for our panel uh, or things that you're seeing? Patty? Yeah, I'm back. Um, yeah, what we've run into, which I feel like everybody else has run into as well, is once everything hit, we were pretty well locked out. Uh, we did a, a, the food where we take the food to them and they could no longer receive outside food. So it had to come from their cafeteria. So once we finally got everything going, then we were allowed to help with the distribution uh, of, this, of, this, of the food at that point. But uh, we had been working also, there's a school at the, at the jail um, and we have been working through them and they did not shut us out at that mm -hmm. stage. But we really were working primarily with the teachers, again, providing that mental support and the little perks uh, for the teachers. So I think the next, the school year is going to be very challenging to see what we can do. And I, I appreciate hearing what all has been done because it gives me some directions to look and see uh, what is going on. So I appreciate the input that the, the panel has given us. Thank you. And Patty, remind us where you're serving. I'm at Denton Trinity, Trinity okay. and Denton. Great. Thanks, Patty. Others. Oh, Martha? Yeah. Um, we're real concerned, as Dana mentioned, about what this is going to do to the academic, um, academics of the kids. So one of the things we've decided is to just um, put as many books in kids' hands as we can this summer. So we're working with the apartment complexes to put books in the laundry rooms. We're working with all the food distribution people to put books, you know, give out books. I know uh, DISD has sent, is sending out packets to kids as well. But um, that, that to us seems like the most um, helpful thing we could do. It, it, it's arm's length, but maybe it'll make a difference. That's right. There is a, a great disparity in our communities uh, in terms of access to books ordinarily, and then it makes a huge difference in terms of reading. So that's a great idea. Others? Andrew, I just wanted to mention, I think this is a good opportunity for churches that maybe have um, had an on and off relationship with schools or maybe haven't been in touch since all this happened mm. to kind of reach out and end the school year by kind of reintroducing yourself to the school. Because I think what can happen is then the school, as they're making plans this summer, whatever comes in the fall, they can say, oh, we have this research resource of this neighborhood school and so I think even if you're you know maybe not in a relationship or want to restart or something like that I'm glad to help resource on that but I do think just in reaching out because this is also a big time for kids making transitions mm. um, fifth graders going to middle school and all of that I, I really feel like that that we can aid in that we we understand those transitions in the church and in our faith communities and and can be welcome maybe support to say i even asked our principal she said i don't know what we're doing with fifth graders i said well you know let let us know because we 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 might be able to pull off some ideas but we always want to take the lead of the school and so if the school's not ready to do something then we just lay back and wait but i don't think it can hurt to just ask those questions and to say we're here when you're ready um to make de decisions about that and we're glad to be supportive of what you decide is best that's a great word amy yeah i'm from uh, christ church and farmers branch 
Um, <clears throat> so we normally have mentors and readers in our schools. Um, and we've been reached out to by the mentor leader to see if we can still make those connections. Um, and, but the, then after that, it's, it's a challenge to get those finalized because you have to get the permission from the parents to allow you to either video into their home basically. So we're kind of at a stuck point right now. And so I have a question on who, who do you suggest we reach out to at the schools um, so that we can help? Like, I don't think we need to go directly to the superintendent. Is there somebody that you suggest that we go to in order to be able to kind of start that process and move along the process? So to, to get mentoring going in the in first place, um, I, um, mostly worked with the school counselor and the principal of that particular campus and so um, my guess is that it would be a combination effort um, I mean, we, we already have a mentor system put together at the school. Um, I'm even just saying the ones that currently already have a student that they mentor, um, we're trying to get that connection back made, not even to start new mentoring, but right. just to get that one connection going. So we already have that with our church and um, uh, three of our schools. So we're trying to kind of mm -hmm. keep that connection moving forward. So it's a matter of the technology. It's that it's the, all, all our kids that are in mentoring relationships are the exact same kids that don't have access to. That's what we're finding, yeah. So who is it that you guys suggest that we reach out to at the schools? I can tell you for us, um, I'm in Coppell, um, but we have a, we've had a seven year partnership with our schools. And it was the counselor and those students that didn't have access to internet and computers, actually our church stepped in and, and filled that gap. So we paid for internet access. And then we also um, have actually had other members step up to provide the technology to do that. So our mentors, um, when this all happened, they then had the ability, we use, our, our school system is actually using all the same system. Um, so they gave us permission on the platform to have our mentors meet online because um, we were providing those services. Um, wow. We, we have that long relationship of trust. Um, and, but it was the counselors and then the school nurses. Um, and they identified other students that would, that kind of just needed a holy listener. Um, and so, and we've actually provided mentors just for holy listening, sort of like even minister for children and youth. Um, they just kind of stand in the gap and they listen. Um, and then they're able to, you know, if they, if they see anything, then they, they've, they've got this kind of covenant relationship with counselors and nurses to say, hey, this family needs to be looked at. Something's going on here and they need some help. Um, but again, our church provides the resources and tools. We partner with the um, Pastoral Counseling Service Center and we provide mm -hmm. six sessions of therapy. So again, it's all of the relationships and they know that there are services that are connected. So then they, they've been more open to it. That's fabulous. Right. Mary Harris. <laughs> Um, this is Mary Harris. I'm at uh, First Denton, and we have a long-standing relationship with one elementary school, but then, of course, our students move out to other schools, and we follow them. Amy, our mentoring program is through communities in schools of North and so they have social workers in the schools where we are, and our contact for the type of thing you're looking for would be the school social worker. You're making me realize though, they won't be working over the summer. So I really need to be working with mm -hmm. them now for the kind of connections we're gonna need in the fall. But if we did not have those social workers, I agree with Martha, I would go to the counselors. They're the ones who could, who have the best chance of filling in those home relationships. We did a thing that in retrospect was really lucky. In November, our church has an alternative gift fair where we raise money for many missions. And I do a boost for our school partnership. Every year I ask the principal of our primary school, what he sees as the most important need. He said Chromebooks for special ed students. And this may be true of your school too. 
the special ed students were not included in the district's um, technology budget because the school was depending on the federal special education funds to pay for Chromebooks for them. And then the funds didn't cover technology. So I, I wasn't sure how people would respond to this request, but especially older members of the church who somewhere earlier in their lives had been involved with a special needs child gave generously. And we were able to provide Chromebooks for the kids at our school who didn't have them. Other schools have PTAs, but we don't. So this was by, by luck a great investment. But those need, the school districts are going to be purchasing technology all summer, not just computers, but hotspots and lots of refinements that were not available last year. Hmm. Thank you, Mary. Um, other, other questions, I hope that's, that's helpful, Amy. Um, any other questions that you would like to get some help with? I think uh, question if there's is that Martha go ahead well, I think we've got some technical difficulties there's a safety issue of oh it's not working could you restate the question yeah I'm wondering if anyone else has had problems with um, the issue of, can we have a volunteer online with a student? Is there, are there dangers to that that we need to consider or take cautions about? That's a great question. I, I think um, if school districts haven't already worked on this, they will be in a greater way around volunteers and technology. Like I know things like when we go through the Dallas ISD training, it's like, you know, don't text your student and stuff like, you know, there's some basic guidelines that they have. I think all of those are going to have. To be in specific training put around um, best practices around technology and mentoring. I, I haven't seen anything. If anyone has, I'd, I'd love to take you up on that one too because I, I just haven't haven't seen it. I, I don't know how much of that exists yet. Right, these are new realities facing us. Hmm. Well, um, I'm cognizant that our, our time is, is about up and I wanna thank uh, thank you, Holly and Montreal and Dana for your time today um, and for all of the rest of you who have been able to uh, be a part of this conversation. So Ed, you have Ed Lance uh, from, it said, uh, my wife is an elementary school counselor. She thinks that most counselors will be available through the first week of June and then again starting the first week of August and it will be hard to get a hold of someone in July. Okay, that's that's helpful for those of us who need to get these relationships built. Yeah, and that that's not a definitive statement. That was okay. just what that <laughs> that's just kind of her thought on, you know, school districts across the country. That in July it's going to be really really hard to to get a hold of of administrators and counselors and so forth. Okay, thank you, Ed. Sure. Okay, anything else y'all need? tied up. Okay. Well, Andy, would you um, offer us a prayer, keeping in mind these students and teachers and staff and, um, and families that we're working with and thinking about these days? Absolutely. Again, uh, thanks, Montreal, Dana, Holly, for uh, leading us in this conversation and for all of you in the ways that you are on the ground. Um, Working, working with the students and families in your communities. Um, I pray that God will open doors for all of you this summer and fall uh, to offer a witness to the love of Christ. So, um, so receive this benediction. Go forth and even though um, the faces and the needs of so many students may uh, be hidden from so many in the world, uh, may, may we see them. And may we see them as God sees them. 
and may the Spirit move in us uh, to respond, to offer them uh, help and hope in a graceful way. Uh, God bless you all in your ministry in the days to come. Amen. Amen. And we'll offer this uh, uh, video will be uh, recorded and edited and posted on our website, along with some notes uh, and links that may be helpful. Thanks, y'all.